Grace, peace, and mercy be unto you from God our Father and his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We've been taking this journey, and last week in the journey, we began with the story of of Moses and the way we, we, we know we know what's gone on with Moses. We know we go from from uh, Joseph. Joseph went into Egypt, and and all kinds of amazing things happened to Joseph. His brothers intended to sell him into slavery there, and then in Egypt, Joseph ends up rising because of the gifts that he has to becoming governor over all of Egypt. And the people honored him, and he brought his family back into Egypt, and they settled in the land of Goshen. And it was great. Uh, the, The Egyptians just honored the Hebrews because it was the wisdom of Joseph that enabled them to survive the famine, the seven years of famine. But that generation passed away, and then the next, and the next, until the time came when the generations of Egyptians no longer remembered all the good things that the Hebrews, led by Joseph, had done for them, how they got them through these seven years of famine. And so they begin to to become afraid of the Hebrews, because the Hebrews were uh, were fruitful and multiplied, and, and they became numerous, right, in the land. And so they thought, you know, what we'll do, we'll enslave the Hebrews, and because it's win-win for us. If we enslave them and put them under hard labor, they'll have less children, and they're going to die young, and so their numbers will diminish instead of grow. Plus, we got somebody to build all our cities and all our stuff and take care of us, so win-win for us. So they enslaved the Hebrews. But the Hebrews did not diminish. God was with them and blessed them, and they continued to to grow in numbers. They came up with a new plan, these Egyptians. They they said, you know, we'll we'll go to the midwives, and we'll tell the Hebrew midwives, when children are born, you know, if it's a girl, that's okay, but if it's a boy, kill it. Because they figured if we take the men out, you know, we'll kind of cut down the population. Less men, less babies, go figure. So this is what they do. The Hebrew midwives, Shipra and Pua, when the, what they did was they kind of connived and they didn't do what they were told and they didn't kill the babies. And the Egyptians came and they would ask them, well, what's going on? And they said, well, you know, the, the, the Hebrew women, they're, they're just very, they're strong. And when the babies come before we arrive. There's nothing we can do. So the Egyptians began to to look for the children, these young children, and make sure that they were put to death. And so Moses' mother, she gave birth, and it was a boy, and she knew that there would be a death sentence on his head. So we remember the story, right? Makes the reed basket in the River Nile, found found by uh, Pharaoh's daughter, taken, raised in Pharaoh's court, until one day he saw an Egyptian and a Hebrew slave fighting, killed the Egyptian, and then had to flee because there was a death sentence on his head. Now we're almost up to where we are in the story today because what happens is Moses flees and he sees a, a couple of young ladies with some herds and he helps water the flock and he keeps them safe. And the girls, they run back to their father and say, hey, this guy, he helped keep us safe and helped water the flocks. And the guy's like, son-in-law, and and marries Moses to one of his daughters and puts Moses over his flocks, and his flocks do well. So life is good for Moses. He's in exile, but he's safe. He's got a wife. He's got a job. Life is good. And then God drops in, right, and speaks to Moses through the burning bush and sends him back to Egypt in order for Moses to to bring all of God's people out into freedom because God is promising them a land, right? God is promising what we call the promised land, a land flowing, God says, with milk and honey. So Moses goes along with his brother-in-law Aaron to Pharaoh and says the, the big classic line, what? let my people go, right? But Pharaoh doesn't, and then the ten plagues come. And in the end, The people are let go. The people are let go. And they go on this journey. And God is with them. 
And Pharaoh comes to his senses and he sends his army, the strongest, most powerful army in the world. They have chariots, right? And they have spears and they have shields. And they're chasing after their slaves because they realized all the slaves are gone. Who's going to do all the stuff? And then the Hebrews run and they come up against the Red Sea and it's this big body of water and they're, they're traveling slow. They have old, old folks with them and they have little babies with them and no, they can't run. And here come the chariots, right? Chariots racing along. So God parts the Red Sea. God lets the Hebrews go through and then smashes the Red Sea down upon Pharaoh's army, drowning them. And then the people run out of food. And God sends manna to feed them. And then the people get sick of manna. And they want meat. And God sends quail, birds, to feed them. And then the people run out of water and there's no water. And then God sends water to them at the rock of Mara. The people grumble and grumble and fail to trust God again and again and again till finally they end up at Mount Sinai. And Moses goes up, for the cloud of the Lord has covered, right, the top of the mountain. And Moses goes up, and the people and Aaron, they wait at the bottom. And Moses is up there a long time, 40 days in in the Old Testament, it's sort of slang for a really long time. So Moses is up on the mountain a really, really long time because God's got a lot of stuff. God's not only giving him the Ten Commandments, but there's a lot of other rules and regulations that God is giving to him separately, teaching Moses to teach the people how they can be God's people because God has chosen the Hebrews, set them apart to be a light, set them apart. And in order to set them apart in a land where people worship all these pagan gods, they needed a lot of rules on how to be God's people. But the people began to get nervous. And they looked at Aaron and they said, we don't know anything about this Moses guy. Make us gods so we may worship them. So Aaron says, fine, give me all your gold, all your jewelry, your bracelets, your rings, and melts them down and makes this golden calf something familiar to the people, probably similar to some of the gods they'd seen around in the land. And they honor and worship and they say, here is the God that brought you out of Egypt. And God up on the mountain with Moses is paying attention. Paying attention. Now, you and I, we, we want to go to Scripture. And we want to know the mind of God. We want to know how God thinks. We want to know uh, by the rules by which God works in the world. We want to know what God expects. But then we are con confronted with this truth that both shatters us and builds us up in hope fills our hearts with thankfulness. We find out that God can and does change God's mind. God can change God's mind. God has a plan and then God abandons that plan and goes and does something else. It shatters us because how then can you go to Scripture and say, well, God says, I will do this if you do this, and then God chooses to do something else altogether, but you and I, we know different. We know that this is how God has worked, right? In the Garden of Eden, the very first story that we began with in this narrative journey, God told to Adam and Eve, if you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the center of the garden, if you eat of that fruit, you're going to die, and then God changed God's mind. God doesn't kill them. For God, at God's heart, and this is important, God, in God's heart, at the core of God's being, God is a God of grace and forgiveness. God intends to destroy the people of Israel 
for their lack of faithfulness. Because God has proven God's self faithful. God rescued them from Egypt when they were hungry. God brought the manna. When they wanted meat, God brought the quail. When the armies of Pharaoh and the chariots were racing down on them with shiny spears and shields, God parted the Red Sea. God destroyed the most powerful army in the world as if it was nothing. And here yet, the people want to make God over in their own image, in this golden calf, in something that they can understand. They want God to look exactly like the way they want. They want to worship God exactly the way that they want. Aaron, make us a God that we can worship. We don't know anything about that other God, you know, the one that's been in front of us this whole journey as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. We want a God that looks like a God that we're comfortable with. Make us something like a golden calf. But here's the thing. We don't get the luxury of making God act and look like the God that we want, that makes us comfortable, that is consistent in a way, that makes it easier on us. So here's the dilemma. God is angry. For look at all that God has done, and now the people are dancing around a golden calf and saying, this is our God. This is our God that brought us out of Egypt. So God tells Moses, hey, step out of the way because I am about to destroy all those people. And I'll make a new people out of your people, just like I promised Abraham. I'm going to do to you. Now, if you were Moses, you might think that this is incredible because, wait, God's going to make a people out of me? All my descendants are going to be God's chosen people? My numerous as the stars, the same promise given to Abraham? But here's the thing. Moses does not hesitate. Moses has no internal dilemma. There's no temptation here for Moses. Moses immediately begins negotiations with God. Moses reminds God about what lies in the heart of God. Moses gives God pause and brings God back to who God is in the core of God's being. Later in the Old Testament, this core of God's being will be reflected again and again in a promised future. Isaiah says this about this future that was growing out of the heart of God. I am coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory, and I will set a sign among them. And then Jeremiah talks about that future. At that time, Jeremiah says, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord, and all nations shall be gathered to it. And then the psalmist, right, David, he talks about that future. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. The future is about God gathering all the people. How through the chosen people of Israel, God is going to be gathering all nations of the world unto himself. The promise for the people of Israel becomes a promise that ultimately is fulfilled as we understand it through Jesus God reconciling himself to all people, Jew and Gentile. And reconcile is just a nice fancy word for the arms of God reaching out, right, and pulling all people to himself. So God is reminded by Moses. Moses has an interesting argument, right? He says, look, you know, if you do this, then the Egyptians are going to say, ha, ha. That God brought those people out to freedom only to kill them on the mountain. So Moses is arguing to God, don't wipe out the Israelites for being unfaithful because the Egyptians are going to scoff at you. And why should God care what the Egyptians think? Because they don't worship him. Why should it matter if God wipes out the Israelites and just 
starts fresh with Moses. Because at God's core of God's being, at the depth of God's heart, God defines God's self by being a God of forgiveness and grace. Moses' argument about the Egyptians foreshadows for us a future in which all people do matter. For it comes into fruition in Christ who becomes the means by which God reconciles God's self to the world, gathers all people back. Moses says, don't make yourself a mockery before the Egyptians. Why should God care? Because amazingly, God does about the Egyptians and about all the people. For God has a plan that is unfolding through the course of Scripture to bring all people back to himself. And so, God changes God's mind in a grace-filled moment. God sends Moses back down the mountain to call the people once again to repentance, to turn their hearts back to the one true God who forgives and loves. Moses helps God to open God's mind up to greater acts of grace and forgiveness. Now you and I have to ask ourselves how we can be people like Moses. How can we be part of God's reconciling Act among the people of the world. Paul, writing the New Testament, says that you and I are ambassadors for Christ. Ambassadors. Representing Christ in the world. Showing everyone. What does an ambassador do? An ambassador is showing everyone the goodness of the place that they represent. Showing everyone how wonderful and amazing their native country is. Well, an ambassador for Christ shows people how amazing and wonderful their God is. Paul says, you and I are ambassadors for Christ, bringing that message of reconciliation out into the world. You and I, we are part of the plan of God a plan that we see this morning beginning to unfurl as God changes God's mind. Never again in Scripture after this moment will destruction of God's people be on God's mind. God may call for justice, God may punish, but from this moment on, in times of faithfulness and unfaithfulness, God continues to work through God's people and continues to work through us to this day. You and I, ambassadors for Christ, to people who do not yet know God, for whom the message of a God whose heart is filled with grace and forgiveness and love waits to be revealed to them through our words, through our actions, through our love, yours and mine. This is the task to 
which God sets us in our lives. Amen.